Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. The pain was so deep, I even felt a physical pain, but the mental anguish was horrific and I didn't feel I had, I could turn to God for comfort either. I felt that he had rejected me and that he had abandoned me just as mum and dad abandoned me when I was little. That was the thinking that was going on in my head. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, last time, Karen Mace shared with us about her troubled childhood and how she never really felt loved by her mother. Then, she and her husband went to serve as missionaries in South America, where tragedy struck. Two of her daughters died when a faulty heater leaked gas into the room they were in. This sent Karen into a crisis of faith that lasted for several years and stirred up doubts and insecurities from her own childhood. Karen is the author of the book Healing Begins in the Heart and she'll share how God's love eventually broke through as she continues her chat with Eric Scadabo from her home in Tasmania. I remember before we went out the first time that he reassured me when I had doubts that he would be with me and he would smooth the path for us. And I was very confident that he was. And then that was it. Hmm. On the 20th of November in 1993, Illy and Sarah died. And um, it threw my whole life into chaos. In that very night, those voices started in my head again. Mm -hmm. You deserve this. You're a bad mother. And I really felt that, Eric. Wow. And all I could think of was the times that I'd shouted at them, that I'd yelled at them, Mm -hmm. that I'd... uh, All the things that I'd done wrong and... Mm -hmm. um, I just said, God, I know, this is it. You're punishing me. You're punishing me. And why didn't you take me? Why didn't you leave the girls? And that's, I really felt that I was being, everything I'd come to believe about myself as a child, Mm. that I wasn't good enough, that I I didn't have anything really to offer, all those things just came flooding back. And the voice inside my head was a condemning critic that said I deserved this. Mm. And that was, I... The pain was so deep, I even felt a physical pain, Hmm. but the mental anguish was horrific and I didn't feel I had, I could turn to God for comfort either. Why is that? I felt that he had rejected me and that he had abandoned me just as mum and dad abandoned me when I was little. That was Hmm. the thinking that was that was going on in my head. And, of course, you know, at those times, I suppose it's the ideal time for the enemy to feed his lies and Mm -hmm. that deception. Mm -hmm. And because I think my my faith hadn't gone deep enough um, at that time, I hadn't really, I didn't really have a strong understanding of of what a deep relationship with Jesus is. Was. Isn't that something? You had gone to Bible school. Yep. Preparing mm-hmm. to be a missionary. Yep. But you're saying, looking back, the whole unconditional love from your Heavenly Father, that didn't penetrate your heart. No, it didn't. And I think, you know, that's that's something that I'm very conscious of when I'm working with, with clients today. Mm-hmm. I love to work with, with Christians who are a bit like I was. Mm-hmm. back then because I know what the enemy is doing mm. and I know what the love of God is mm. and I know what it can be like for them when they can step into that love and when that perfect love can get rid of the fear because it's the fear that's behind those feelings. Yeah. That's that's what the enemy uses. You know. Yeah, isn't that something obviously intellectually – you had the head knowledge to know that God loves you. You've read the verses, Mm. but it still, it still didn't penetrate your heart. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. 
I didn't realise, but I'd put a protective coat around my heart. Mm. <laughs> Unconsciously. Yeah, I didn't realise I, I had done it, that mm. I had put this protective coat around my heart. Mm -hmm. And when this crisis happened, when this horrible thing happened, that's when everything started to fall apart mm. because I couldn't control anything anymore. Mm. I could see that, you know. I think what, what we do when we're so uncertain about things and when we have no confidence in anyone or anything is we try to manage everything around us mm. so that it, we are protected, mm. so that we're safe. Mm -hmm. But in reality, we're not ever safe unless we're actually in God <laughs> mm. yeah. and unless we're walking moment by moment with him. So you were in Ecuador in the early 90s when this happened. Yeah. And uh, just to share a little bit of our story, my wife Gina and I went to Ecuador in 2001, 2002, and Joe and Ruth mm. Baxter, who you know, showed yeah. us around and they said, oh, when you're looking for a place, make sure about the gas leaks because of what happened yeah. to this one family. So I had heard about what happened to you when we were there about 10 yeah. years later or so. They didn't know who it was or that I didn't have a chance to speak with you at some point. Mm. But um, obviously there's a whole lot more going on than just the tragedy. I mean, it's terrible enough to lose your children at such a young age, which is horrific in and of itself. But now we're hearing the other layers of the tragedy. This was a tragedy on several different layers. Mm. Mm. And yet, you know, we, we say God can, um, he can use anything mm -hmm. for our good, really. And while well, I never did, I don't think I'll ever understand the mm -hmm. whys other yeah. than the reality is that when we're in this world, you know, there are things that are going to happen mm -hmm. that just because we're human and it's the world we live in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, in this world, there will be troubles. Yeah, there will be troubles. But mm -hmm. God can use all things for our good, for mm -hmm. those who love him. And I know that he knew that deep down I loved him, mm -hmm. but it was a bit like that I didn't have the attunement, the mm -hmm. emotional connection. Mm -hmm. I was actually emotionally distant from God. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, my thinking about it as, as I've walked through this with God. Yeah. Um, I didn't trust him with all of me. Mm. So um, he taught me through through that time a lot of things. But it was 13 years that I had my back turned to God. Yes. Tell us about what happened next after this tragedy. Well, I didn't openly turn away from God. And I don't think... I don't think I wanted to turn away from him, really, because I kind of knew <laughs> that it was the right thing to have a, you know, to have God there. But I didn't want to face him because I didn't want to. If I turned around and actually looked at God, and uh, I was afraid of what I'd see. Mm. I really did think that I would see someone who was disgusted with me, who held me in disdain. So huh. I thought if. And I didn't want to hear what he had to say because I thought back. Well, I thought back on the things that I believed he had said to me before, and I thought I don't know if I can trust you. So mm. best not really listen. Although I had my hands over my ears, and I, I didn't have them tightly over my ears. So there was something in me that still wanted to mm. to hear him. Hmm. But for a long time, I lived in what I'd call a swampy no man's land spiritually, uh, 13 years actually, and I really felt like a hypocrite a lot of that time because on the outside, I was um, I was still a, a good Christian who I went to church, I, I spoke in, in, in meetings, I um, related well to people, but on the inside... I was a mess. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't have, really didn't have that personal relationship with, with God. And I, I did. I felt like a hypocrite. Hmm. Uh, when people would say to me, oh, your faith is so strong, you're such an example, and I'd think, oh, just stop. Hmm. Because that, <laughs> that didn't feel, feel right to me that they were saying that, and it wasn't. 
if they only knew how you're feeling inside, you're probably thinking. Yeah, that's right. And I, if they knew how I was feeling inside, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. That's also what you were thinking. Yep. So you stopped being a missionary and came back mm. to Australia? We didn't stop immediately. We did come back for um, a short while after Ilya and Sarah died. We we brought them back here to bury them at Carbilla, which is here in Launceston, mm-hmm. because that was important for the family. And we actually went back six weeks. We were back here, I think, in Tasmania. Then we went back to Ecuador, mm-hmm. and we... Um, had been moved out of that apartment by some lovely friends while we were back here and we were in a different apartment. And then eventually we moved to the guest house, managed the guest house. Ross continued with what he was doing. And we probably would have stayed there if our daughter Miri hadn't been as rebellious as she was (laughs) (laughs) and and, um, was very close to being removed from the Alliance Academy for her misdemeanors. So we thought it was best to bring her bring her back here. And um, at that stage, Ross brought her back. But then after he got back to Ecuador, we discovered that um, Miri was, oh, no, Miri was pregnant at the time. That's right. So we realized we couldn't stay in Ecuador. We just had to finalize things there and come back to back to Tasmania so it was it was pretty rocky in a lot of ways Mm. and I suppose in some ways for me it was it was a distraction that validated me not having time to spend with God you know I had an excuse I had a reason because Mm. Miri was keeping us very occupied at the time You're listening to The Story. Our guest today is once again Karen Mace, who's the author of the book Healing Begins in the Heart. And as we've been hearing, the tragic death of her two daughters in South America sent her into a crisis of faith that lasted for several years and she had basically turned her back on God. But as we'll hear, God had not abandoned her and healing finally comes into her life. All that and more is coming up when we return. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax, and this is The Story. Today, Eric Scadabo is once again chatting with Karen Mace, who's the author of the book, Healing Begins in the Heart. As we heard before the break, Karen was kind of just going through the motions of a Christian faith after the tragic death of her two daughters in South America, while she and her husband were missionaries there. In reality, she was going through a crisis of faith for several years, and eventually she and her husband returned to Tasmania from the mission field. Now, we'll hear what happened next in Karen's life. What finally caused you to turn the corner and turn around? Well, the funny thing is that it was actually our daughter. Well, not our daughter as such, but our daughter was, um, she married a man back here and it wasn't a very happy marriage at all. It wasn't good. And he um, wanted, he wanted her to go to Adelaide where he was from to live there because he felt it would be better to be away from us. So um, in 2007, I think it was, I wanted to go to Adelaide to see Miri. Um, She was struggling with a marriage and I was really concerned. I was starting to feel, I don't know, I was feeling um, as though there was something wrong. I just felt as though something was missing. I wasn't sure what it was and I just thought um, I was feeling a bit unsettled and I thought it was because of Miriam. So I went to South Australia Mm-hmm. And um, Miriam was going to Edge Church in South Australia, mm-hmm. in uh, near Adelaide, mm-hmm. Renella, I think. Mm-hmm. And she asked me if I wanted to go to church with her, and I just went, oh, yeah, all right, because she was really enjoying it there and finding a great fellowship there. And Were, were you going to church yourself at that time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, on and off. Okay. On and off. 
on and off, yes, but not going because I felt obligated. It was a mm. duty, mm. yeah. So um, I said, all right, I'll go to church. And the funny thing is that when we walked into that church, it was just incredible. I'd never been there before, but I can still feel the warmth that just dropped on me mm. as we walked into that church. And I felt welcomed. I felt a part of the place, never been there before at all. It was a really, really interesting experience. And then people were saying, giving me prophetic words and um, there was just a sense of being at home. Mm. And while while we were there, before, before worship started, before things happened, I had this very odd experience. It was like I saw... Jesus, it was a moment in time where there wasn't anything else but just me. And no, I didn't see Jesus. I heard Jesus' voice mm -hmm. and he called me. And there was a, a like a hand clap. That's enough, Karen. It's time. And I went, oh. And it was like God was saying, okay, I've let you go on for, for long enough. Now it's time. But while Jesus was standing there, he put out his arms and he waited for me to go to him. Hmm. He, didn't, he didn't force me. He didn't give me an ultimatum. He just put out his arms. And when I walked into them, I can still feel him wrapping his arms around me. It was just this amazing experience. Hmm. And he said... I've always been with you. I never left you. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit later in the service, a lady a few seats along from me um, leaned across and she said, I think God is saying to you, there's no turning back. <laughs> huh. So it was a pretty profound experience. Yeah, yeah. And that was the beginning of the, of the turning back to God. And he started showing me lots of different, lots of things from that moment on. And one of those things was, I don't know if you've heard of VMTC, Victorious Ministries Through Christ. No, I'm not familiar with him. Okay, it's a, it's a prayer ministry. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine is um, a leader in the ministry and she'd been wanting me to go to a prayer school. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, oh, yes, yes, one day, one day. Mm -hmm. And I, I just didn't want to go. Anyway, I felt I really needed to go to this prayer school, and I did, and that was later in the year after Edge, and it was at that prayer school that I had this moment toward, right at the towards the end um, where we were all gathered, and they just they asked me, you know, did God do anything special for you during this school? And there was this something in me that rose up and it was like, you've seen the movie Braveheart? <laughs> I, I haven't seen it myself, but uh, well, okay, I've well, heard about there's it. A, there's a moment in there where he calls out, freedom! <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what just rose up from within me and this cry from within was just came out. And then, I don't know, I fell on the floor. <laughs> so you yelled freedom or you felt freedom? Yeah, I yelled freedom over. and I felt freedom. And then I just fell to the floor. And this beautiful little lady was, was there, um, a 72-year-old, and she, she was just praying over me. I could feel her praying over me. And while I was on the floor, it was like, you know, the Rio that you, you have in buildings in the um, foundation to to, I don't know, stabilise it or mm -hmm. whatever it does, strengthen the concrete. Mm -hmm. It was like I was having this Rio uh, reinforcement just poured into me all the way through my body. Oh, wow. And at one stage I tried to get up and this lovely little lady said, no, just stay there, dear, because if you get up too soon, the Holy Spirit will just knock you down again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then while I was lying there, one of the leaders of, of that um, prayer time came over to me and he said, God is saying to you, there's no turning back. 
Mm. And, you know, that was said three times to me mm. during that time and I, re I was reminded of what was said when I was at Edge, there's no turning back. Mm. And that was another, you know, there were these little little markers yeah. in my coming yeah. back to God and a sense, of course, that wasn't, that wasn't the end of the struggles, but mm. it was yeah. the beginning of learning why. Mm. and the beginning of trusting God, again, moving into that place mm -hmm. of allowing him to do what he wanted to do mm -hmm. in me. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but going mm. back all the way to your childhood where you had these emotionally absent parents mm. and that kind of planted the seed in your life that somehow you weren't good enough. Yeah. The lie from the devil that you weren't mm -hmm. good enough. And then even when you became a Christian, believing you weren't good enough for God, yeah. And that haunting you for years, especially even more so after the tragedy of losing your two daughters. Mm. So now you're turning back to God. Mm. At that point, did you finally feel, yes, God, you love me unconditionally? Mm. I think it was that, that weekend at the prayer school where that happened. Mm. That's where, hmm. And that's not to say that the enemy didn't try to stir those, you know, oh, of course, yeah. any doubts yeah. that were there. Mm. But every now and again, what I'd learned was that I needed to speak the truth. I needed to know the word because knowing God's word is what makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's the truth. And I started naming these um, thoughts that would come as deceptive brain messages. Mm. And I'd say, hmm. Does this actually align with what God says? Does it align with his His word? And if it didn't, I'd say no. Well, definitely not from God then. So mm -hmm. I just yeah. let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I learned to do that. Mm -hmm. But And I guess he showed me through the training and the further learning that he led me into mm. what to take from that that would help me as well. So that was really good. Yeah, so... Mm -hmm not only have you healed from some of those wounds going all the way back to your childhood, but mm. now, as we've mentioned earlier, you've become a counselor and you're helping others. Please share with us kind of the, the big picture of what's happened to you and the lessons that people can learn from what you've gone through. Mm. Well, um, yes, I am a counselor and a psychotherapist, but primarily I've moved towards working with Christians who are struggling in their faith mm -hmm. who may have mental health illnesses as a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I feel the most benefit and where I can be of most benefit because mm -hmm. my journey speaks to the truth of what God can do. And I think unless I can work with someone who is willing to allow God to work with them and in them, I don't believe I. you can see real healing and ongoing lasting healing unless mm -hmm. God is a part of it. So I, I prefer to work with Christians. Mm -hmm. But because of what I've experienced myself, I know what is possible. I know what God can do. But I'm also aware of how the enemy plays a part in derailing us mm -hmm. and throwing us off all that God has for us. So I guess I can offer that, that wisdom. And I can also offer, I, I listen to what Holy Spirit is saying, and I believe that's an important thing as well when we're, when we're working together to, to bring healing and to bring renewal and to help people to move into a relationship that is based on that perfect love that God offers us rather than, you know, the, um, the lies of, of the enemy. Mm -hmm. So I think... That's what I offer to people mm. um, is a lot of my experience and what God's done in me and that I guess I'm an example mm. of, of what can happen once we really trust God. Amen. Well, it's certainly been a painful journey, but now because of everything you've gone through, you're uniquely qualified to help others who are going through similar circumstances. Mm. Thank you so much, Karen Mayes, for sharing your story with us today. Thank you for letting me do it. Our guest today has been Karen Mace, And as we heard, she is now a counsellor, 
and psychotherapist, helping others who are going through similar experiences as she went through. It's wonderful to hear how God is using her and how she can now rest in the loving arms of her Heavenly Father, confident in his unconditional love for her. Well, how about you? Do you sometimes have doubts and insecurities and have gone through similar tragic experiences as Karen? If you'd like to pray with someone about God's unconditional love for you, our prayer line is 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's one 800 772 Nine three six, and we'd love to pray for you on that number one eight hundred double seven two nine three six. Finally, to find out more about Karen and the many ways she's helping people, you can visit her website. It's karenmace dot com. That's karenmace dot com. While there, you can look up her books, Healing Begins in the Heart, and also A Grief Revealed: Stories of Finding and Navigating Your Way Through Loss. Once again. Her website is karenmace.com. Well, thanks for joining us for part two of Karen's story. It's always great to hear how God can turn tragic situations around. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. The story. Just another way vision is connecting faith to life. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.